some of you may be familiar with Ms. Gurian from her residence here in Michigan. From 1997 to 1999, she served as the acting director of the Cranbrook Institute of Science during a critical period of construction, redesign, and installation. From 1991 to 1994, she was deputy director and chief operating officer of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which opened to the public in April 1993. During 1990 and 1991, Ms. Gurian served as deputy director for public uh, program planning for the National Museum of the American Indian. From 1987 to 1990, she was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Museums at the Smithsonian, providing oversight for all 14 Smithsonian museums. For 16 years, from 1972 to 1987, Ms. Gurian was the director of the Exhibit Center, the public facility at the Boston Children's Museum, known for exhibition and program experimentation and innovation, fostering enhanced family learning and service-oriented programs. And from 1969 to 1972, she served as Director of Education at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, Massachusetts, where she was charged, or was in charge, of building community-controlled playgrounds during a period immediately following civil unrest. I could go on and on and on, but I think you all get the picture. Elaine Human Gurian knows museums. She has been and continues to be an extremely influential member of the museum profession. She is a practitioner who thinks. Lucky for us, she also writes. But as a practitioner, she does not have time to write books. Instead, she has produced well over 20 important articles and essays, provocative thought pieces that push our thinking about museums and their role in society in new directions. In fact, we'll be talking about a number of these issues the issues that she raises uh, in these writings um, this evening. It is serendipitous that her visit with us coincides with the publication of a new book that collects 22 of these papers, essays, and articles. It is absolutely terrific to have all of her best writing in one place. As Brad mentioned, there will be a book signing after our conversation. In, the, in uh, 2004, Elaine Graham was presented with the Highest American Museum Award, the Distinguished Service to Museums Award by the American Association of Museums. She has been the recipient of numerous other awards that recognize her contributions to the museum profession. Elaine Graham also has served in a number of leadership positions in key professional organizations, such as the American Association of Museums and the International Council of Museums. She is presently the president of the Museum Group, an association of some of North America's leading independent museum consultants. Please join me in welcoming Elaine Gurian. So to begin with, um, talk a little bit about the meaning of objects in museums. One of my favorite Gurian article titles is Noodling Around with Exhibition Opportunities. In fact, you've written several articles about the process of exhibition planning and the significance of the object in various exhibition settings. As we move further down the continuum, away from what might be characterized as object-centered museum experience towards audience-centered experience, what do you see as the fate of the object in those museum professionals whose careers are focused on caring for and interpreting those objects? Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And second of all, for those of you who sit in the audience, you too will have a resume like that if you just live long enough. So <laughs> it's just the resume of an old person. Who's young at heart? who's young at heart and has great frequent flyer miles. <laughs> um, let's look at the museum in a number of different ways. One is, is it a place? And um, for me, it's a place in which things are evidence and the place is important. And the environment is important. 
but the things that are evidence that people come to see are not necessarily only objects. And they are certainly not only objects when we give them definitions that are reified, like original or important or aesthetic. Um, the museum is really a, a place for me of civic engagement in which the objects are a fulcrum on which stories and other meanings attach. And I don't get too fussed about the thingness of it all. Um, so I wrote a paper called The Object of This Exercise, which tries to look at all the many meanings we attach to the word object, so we would start to think of them in a much broader context. Um, and I was reminded the other day that I went to, um, yesterday they inducted people into the Rock and Roll Mu Hall of Fame. On the top floor of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, there's a little tricycle, and uh, it has a little sign, and it says, um, um, Presley, what's her, Lisa Presley's trike. Um, well, my children had the same trike. And uh, it's a beat up trike, ubiquitous of the time. So how do you know it's Lisa Presley's? And why do you care? Um, you know it's Lisa Presley's because they give you a sign that says it's Lisa Presley's, and it depends on whether you believe in signs or not. Um, and what you care about is that here is a trike that's just like the trike your own kids have. Lisa Presley must be real. Um, or you think other things like, couldn't Elvis afford a better trike? If I could <laughs> afford this, why, why does she have it? Uh, whatever you think, it's about the sign, not about the trike, mm -hmm. because this trike was bought at a store. Um, so objects have a huge range um, you were asking me tonight about um, ephemeral tradition, and is that an object? In the end, it's probably an object. So before we get too hung up on the reification of the object, what I'd rather talk about is the importance of civic engagement in a physical space. And what I'm really interested in is, where are the spaces in our society where strangers can safely um, come to be with each other? And where are those places where things, um, the accumulation of things, are the reason for which strangers come to each other? So I'm currently very interested in shopping malls and in libraries. Um, and I'm currently angry at the museum world for the impediments they place around the object that make their place less accessible and less exciting and less welcoming than the shopping mall itself. Last year when you were here, um, you spoke with us about the library. Uh, as as a as a system and perhaps a model that might be emulated in certain ways by museums, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I'm I'm obsessed with this, so I've spent a whole year trying to think my way through. Um, when I thought about tonight, I thought in giving this explanation, it's going to be a little like karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. Um, I was driving in a car with my husband who said about a year and a half ago, my husband, um, I have to tell you, was the undersecretary of the Smithsonian and who built nine of the Smithsonian museums. So I was a little startled when he said, I don't really like museums. <laughs> <laughs> so that wasn't so great. Um, I said, how come? He said, because they are not essential. They're nice to have, but they're not essential. And um, that phrase, nice to have but not essential, has stuck with me. And I've asked him then what were essential 
what, what places were essential as opposed to nice to have. And he started to outline them in the following ways. Essential places are the places when you get up in the morning and you need to know the answer to something. You go there as a resource. That's essential. Comes out of personal motivation. What you do in a museum generally is, and the definition for him of nice to have is, it's an outing. It doesn't come from the same, I have to know something. So I started to think, this is the karaoke part, you know, where the ball falls. Where are essential places? Where do you get up in the morning and you need, you go to to find out the answer? The internet, if you use the internet. That's how I discovered what I had to wear here, because I could look up the weather. <laughs> That's essential. Um, the library. And so I started to think about what ab about the library makes it essential, and what about the museum makes it nice to have. And here's what happens at the library. You go to the library, A, you can wander in, it's free. We'll talk about that, it's free. You wander in, nobody asks you anything. You can wander about till you understand how to use it. Then, if you haven't figured it out, you could ask a human being. There's a helpful human being, but that person is not in your face taking a ticket and your money. And there's a system in the library that allows you, like a search engine, follow the ball, like Google, that allows you to announce to no one what your essential question is unless you get stuck at it. And then if your toilet is leaking at home, it's my favorite example, you look up toilets, fixing, and you find out the stack number and you get the library book on fixing your toilet, then you go downstairs and check it out. And the person you're checking it out with does not say, eek, toilets, you should be reading Plato. They check it out. And the person next to you who is reading Plato brings them the book, and they don't say anything about that either. They check it out. It is a non-judgmental system in which your personal question is your own to figure out, and then the system is organized so that you can satisfy your, your quest by access to information. So I thought, how come the museums don't do that? The museums have stuff. The library has stuff. Why don't the museums do that? So if you go back in the history of museums and you go back in the history of libraries, they are the same history. They're the history of power, acquisition of power, and the distribution of it in a kind of parceled out, piecemeal way to really um, reinforce the powerful. And at some point, I don't know yet enough about the history of libraries, but in about 1950-something and again in 1970, the libraries decided, and maybe earlier, democratizing really was their job. And the museums decided that too. And we all wrote the same stuff, except the libraries decided it really was their job. And they invented systems that are non-judgmental systems that allow you to browse. First of all, have a quest, browse, figure out with a superimposed system what it is, satisfy that question, get access to the material you need, and if you need a helper, the helper is non-judgmental. So why can't we have a library like that? So I'm, that's what the paper's about, called the Essential Museum and how the museum would look. And I don't think it's every museum, and I think probably we have to have iconic museums and whatever, but let's talk about small community museums. What do you need to make them essential? Well, in this formulation, you need access to everything they have. 
Now, the technique of access to everything they have is, an, is a Victorian technique called visual storage. It's not a new technique at all. It's what um, the old museums were, which was, we'll display it. So why didn't we like those? Well, I actually did like them. But why did most people not like them? Because that's all they were, dead things and no access to the information that surrounded them. So let's collect all the information. And not all the information that we, the curator, happens to have. All the information that we can think of. And then let's organize it so that if you have other information, you can add it. Follow the bouncing ball, Wikipedia. It's, it's uh, an encyclopedia that grows. And does it have problems? Yes, it has problems. But technically, we can adhere to any word or any object huge panoply of things, the stories, the history, the everything we can think of. And then you can go to the library on your quest, figure it out, have a Google-like system, get there, look at the, the associated material in whatever form and the object. Now, with the library, you've, you've got objects again, but they're relatively uniform in terms of size and, and how they're configured in space and all. So they're able to be stored in you know, they're big and small libraries, but still in a relatively small space relative to museums where you've, you, know, you have a vast range of sorts of objects. How do you overcome the logistics of well, you have access? Everybody has special problems. First of all, the library's books aren't all the same size. They aren't all the same value. Um, but it is true, libraries are mostly reproducible, and objects aren't. But we have now study storage is an old technique, um, computer access to information, and multiple platform information is technically possible. Um, CAD and the ability to look at objects in different ways, technically possible. And I don't know all the answers to, to this. And many people have now read my paper, and it's full of holes. And you can tell me the holes. And then they follow it. I told you this. They follow it by, but you're on to something. And what I seem to be on to is what sociologists are calling customization. Um, which is the hallmark of the learning opportunities of the current age of young adults. That they have so spent. Free choice learning? Well, free choice learning environments that John Falk talks about is slightly different. Mm -hmm. But it's John Falk who told me I'm on to something. Okay. Um, but it's related. What John Falk wants to talk about is that what we used to call informal education. This impulse to learn something. We are all gr grateful when we're not in school. Um, and the sequence by which we learn is anything we wish to know is really a free choice environment. Mm -hmm. But yes, it has something to do with this. Yeah. You'd mentioned uh, in passing one of the things that is good in your estimation about libraries is that they're free. Right. All right. And you've uh, recently, in fact, written a paper um, that argues for the elimination of admission charges in museums. Uh, I was wondering if you'd mind talking a bit about the rationale behind that argument, especially as it relates to the, the, the challenges that institutions have in terms of generating the revenue that, that sustains them. Well, let's back up a second. When I entered the museum business, almost all museums were free. Um, and the funding of them was mostly in the hands of individual philanthropists. And then in America, but not the rest of the world, that dried up. Not the rest of the world, because museums in the rest of the world were public institutions. Private not-for-profit institutions, by and large, was an American or mostly American invention. So Americans then led the way in making their museums into business models and focusing on 
um, earned income and put on charges as their largest source of earned income. And a lot of good came from that. Um, some of it not in expected, but a lot of it very interesting. One of them is that museum people became um, fiscally responsible in administrators. And they understood their actions were tied to money and money outcome. And I know in academic s setting where I am now, filthy lucre isn't what we're supposed to be talking about. But in fact, it gave museums a certain kind of turgor and rigorousness that it didn't have before. Um, the other thing is that it, as museums looked for many sources of income, they started to build spaces in which to earn that income, and they became, quite by accident, mixed-use space environments. They wouldn't have done it had they not been able to earn money for functions, and therefore they built big social spaces and earned money from cafes, and therefore now you can get good food there and earn money from their shop, and so now they have good st food stores. And then they started to look at malls and realize what mixed-use spaces were useful for, and that was to lengthen the stay. Um, so a lot of good things happened. Um, and the bad thing is that museums became dependent on earned income, in part because they could not, as they earned more income, government in certain ways felt less and less responsible. And what's going on in the rest of the world is now, having looked at the American model, Many governments are beginning to withdraw their income, which is too bad. But they became then um, nice to have because they became a day out. Because the behavior you have when you pay money is a different behavior than when you drop in. I know there's a big argument which says, that you only value what you pay for. It's not an argument I subscribe to, but I understand it exists. Um, you go to the library by dropping in between going to the supermarket and going to the dry cleaner. You know how to use it. You know you can go tomorrow. And you know you can go on a focused visit. But if you're going to pay $20 to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, then you're going to get dressed up and you're going to pay them $20. And by gum and by golly, you are going to see bloody everything. Interested or not, fatigue or not, you are not coming back again to pay another $20. You're not coming back tomorrow. So that's one of the huge impediments. The other one is that the transaction is a means test. The first thing you do when you enter a museum, even though you're going to argue the first thing you do when you enter a movie th theater is the same, the first thing you do when you enter a museum is you meet a person who then does a transaction with you which has to do with whether you can afford coming in the place. And that is as much an impediment as anything that I can think of. And interestingly, when you go into a library, the librarian is not sitting there where you have to transact. In fact, you have to find the librarian in order to do the transaction. And the, the transaction that is um, mandatory is upon exiting when you're more comfortable. Um, and that is when you check out the book. And that as a kind of psychological experience is a very different experience than coming in to pay. Or if you can't pay, coming in to declare that you belong to the society that has to be, um, charity has to be given to you. Um, and if you have a membership card, then you get an even more rarefied welcome. Um, I think that is by itself, that very transaction changes the entire way in which you use the institution. And I want to go back and make the argument to government that like the library, this belongs to us all 
and is available to us all. You cannot make the argument about the importance of museums to the government if it really is not available to everyone. I just... Well, the prerequisite seems to be they need to be essential. Well, I... Right, follow the bouncing ball. Right. Um, and so I'm on to something, but I don't know what I'm on to. So it, um, if you all ask me questions later about it doesn't work exactly the way you say, I will all agree with you, but I don't know how to get myself past this. Mm. We are never going to make the argument that museums really house all our patrimony if we can't all use the institution in the same way. I just, I just can't get myself past that part. Okay. Well, sort of a related issue uh, that has to do with the notion of uh, defining uh, museums, and this is something uh, that you've thought and written about. We generally classify museums based on what is contained within them, the nature of the collections. There are art museums, there are science centers, there are zoological parks, there are zoos, uh, history museums, etc. Uh, a few years ago, in fact, you wrote an article uh, that offers a provocative alternative to how we might classify museums, um, uh, uh, a new paradigm uh, that is based um, the audiences, the nature of the audiences that go to the museum, um, the nature of the work, uh, the activity that occurs inside the museum. Um, it's a, a, a model that reflects a shift in thinking uh, about the role of museum, the museum in society, which you've already alluded to. Uh, could you talk a bit about this alternative means of defining the museum? Well, the, the article is called Choosing, and for those of you who are going to this course, you probably had to read it. Um, and it, it's about it, the museum's intention rather than the museum's content. Um, there are m museums who wish to be object-centered. They are mostly, but not exclusively, art museums. Um, there are museums who wish to be narrative museums. That is telling a story. They are mostly, but not exclusively, history museums. But art museums can be narrative museums, and history museums can be object-centered. In fact, many museums, especially the biggest encyclopedic museums, are a mush of all of these. But when you start to parse them out, you start to see that the universe of museums is different. So object-centered, narrative, client-centered. That is, museums who wish to take care of individuals and small social units as their focus. They are mostly, but not exclusively, children's museums and science centers. And interestingly, those museums are the ones that have experimented about learning theory, about exhibition technique, and about objects that are not real. Um, there are community museums. They are museums whose intention is to take care of not small social units, but bigger social units. They are mostly, but not exclusively, um, ethnically specific institutions. Um, Native American museums are focused on their community, and when you look at them, they are um, mostly social service institutions in which the object is only part of a big panoply of, of activity that they do. They look the least like museums. And then there are museums that are um, government, and for want of a better word, national museums, whose intention is to speak for a nation and over which argumentation is made about representation. Um, the Enola Gay, which was a very interesting controversy in museums, was argued between the government members of the United States and um, members of um, opinion groups. The controversy of the Enola Gay was not about an actual exhibition, which at the time did not exist. 
It was really an argument about the ownership of the nation's story because it was going to exist in the Smithsonian. Um, those arguments don't generally take place about private museums in any of the other four categories because the stakes are not so high. But the big government arguments about how we will be represented, the whole notion of patriotism is notions that get played out in national museums, regardless of the content of the museum. So it was, it was an attempt to look at what a museum wanted to be and who they wished to serve, not what they collected. And, and um, there were consequences of their intention. Mm -hmm. Good. Talking about museums that are defined by their collections, um, I have a related question um, that deals specifically with one type of museum, and this is an issue that I've actually been grappling with for a number of years now, that museum is the Natural History Museum. Uh, many natural history museums were founded in the 19th century when curators, influenced by the ideology of social Darwinism, perceived and classified people coming from certain places as part of the world's natural history. Um, the peoples of Africa, the island societies of the Pacific and indigenous Americas, generally perceived as primitive and lacking any sense of history, were situated in evolutionary taxonomies in much the same way that animals and plants were classified. I'd like to believe that this mode of thinking about these people is no longer relevant. Yet, in many communities, natural history museums continue to be the primary museum space where the stories of these peoples are told alongside the dinosaurs, the plants, the birds, and the rocks. Um, be interested to hear what your take is on this particular situation. And if you find it problematic, what do you think can be done to deal with it? Um, I don't think there's a single person who doesn't find it problematic. I mean, the notion that you were going to establish institutions really for exotic flowers and people is an interesting framework in which to establish any institution. Um, what can be done? If you're talking about um, systemic change, you start to see some systemic change. That is that there are cultural history institutions and natural history institutions start to, in some places, divide. But the more interesting story is really now that we have these. Um, if you look at the current um, story of evolution and its debate that's going on in essentially the um, story of the origins of human beings. The arguments that are going on have to do with science and not science. But here you have a museum in which we have part science and part the story of how people see themselves, which is often not science. So the argument about whether or not we need to have science in science museums don't work in these natural history museums because, in fact, Peoples who are represented in these museums have every right to speak directly to the visitor about their worldview. And their worldview incorporates a much larger definition of self than science. So these were established as this kind of scientific thought. But now these museums, I'm always interested in having worked Part of my work has been to work on the reconciliation between indigenous people and non-indigenous people in the way in which the nation will portray the whole nation. So that you have to grapple with how the indigenous people in the community wish to portray themselves and the c conquest people wish to portray themselves. And they have to make some peace 
with these disparate worldviews on a basis of equality. In natural history museums, that has not yet begun to play out, but that is, in fact, what has to be played out. So that the worldview of the majority people about the meaning of rocks and the worldview of the, about the people portrayed about the meaning of life have to be they have to be able to debate that and then incorporate it in a single institution. And that's going to be a very interesting thing. There is no straight science answer in that. And then, in the end, you will not be able to say, these people, this is what they say in natural history, used to, believe in this myth. Um, in a way that distances you from, you can't do that. Because in fact, what is now happening in museums is that the descendants of the original people who are portrayed get to say what they wish to the public. And there is no distance. And in fact, you will have to be a witness to a worldview which is not your own. And um, that's the part that I find the most interesting part of the museology at the moment. Yeah, we have our, our work cut out for us. I, yeah, all of us yeah, have our yeah, work cut yeah. out for us. In 1991, you uh, wrote a paper. It's another one of my favorite Gurian titles, A Jew Among the Indians, How Working Outside of One's Own Culture Works, um, in which you drew upon your experience working with Native Americans in planning the National Museum of the American Indian. And I just found out earlier this evening over dinner uh, that this relationship with the museum continues to this very day. So we're talking about, what, close to 20 years of working um, with From them. 1990. Yeah, OK. So 15, 16 years, yeah. We'd be interested in hearing you talk a little bit about this experience, perhaps commenting on what an outsider can and cannot do in such settings what an outsider can contribute to such a process. And also, it might be interesting to hear um, your take on, now that the uh, NMAI has become a reality, it's now open, um, whether what we see today in the museum is, in fact, what people were talking about 15 years ago. Well, first of all, I'm deeply grateful that um, that I got the privilege of working with people not my own who took the time to trust me and have a conversation with me sufficient so that we could figure out what we were going to do next. I am, as I tell all the people I work with, an auto mechanic. That as I work all over the world by making what people wish to have happen, happen. I know how to build museums. I know how to make them operate. I know what the exhibition process looks like. I am not the keeper of their information. Um, and in a certain way, I, I teach sometimes about how to do cross-cultural negotiations. And cross-cultural negotiations are infinitely easier than same-culture negotiations. So it was much more difficult for me to work at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, where I am not only a Jew, but I am the daughter of German-Jewish immigrants caught in the Holocaust. Um, there, it's incredibly difficult. And for those of you who work in ethnically specific museums, it's always very difficult because people are commenting on your persona. I was, for some, not Jewish enough. For others, I was too Jewish. I belonged to the, they felt free to um, attack me for myself. If you work with others, they are all united in understanding that you're just plain dumb. I mean, you just <laughs> don't get it. And for that, they have um, pity. And if they're 
kind human being, some kindness. So it's much, much easier to do that. On the other hand, what people of specific cultures are afraid about is that you wish to be them. Um, and so for me, to be a Jew was very useful to the Indians because at least for the Indians, they understand it's just another tribe. It's not their tribe, but it's another tribe. And the fact that I knew who I was and that I belonged to a tribe made communication possible. Um, and they would tell me, we did, the NMAI started with 12 um, consultations with big Native American groups, um, cut in different ways, artists, educators, people who lived in this section of America, people who lived in the other section of America. And uh, for those of you who know um, uh, American Indians, they will tell you right away, there are no American Indians. They come from a tribe. There are many, many peoples. So you go around the room and you'd say, I'm so-and-so, I'm from the tribe of such and such. And that would be my turn. I'd say, I'm Eileen Gurian. I'm from the tribe of Israel. And there'd be dead silence. And then about 30 minutes in, somebody would get up and tell a Jewish joke. And in the beginning, I got very startled because the joke would be a different one each time, but it would be not a joke we would tell each other. And then I realized it was a signal that um, they knew who I was and they wanted me to know they knew and it was all okay. We were all there together. So I looked forward each time to hear what <laughs> joke. joke I was going to get. Uh, um, what I learned was that, and it had a profound change in the way in which I work in museums. The Indian people I met were every bit as sophisticated as I am or as Rick West would say, we have foot in both worlds. But their worldview includes a kind of animism that when I first started to hear it, I thought, they're kidding. And then I realized, since it was my job to be their auto mechanic, that A, they were not kidding, and B, it was my job to try and figure out what to do with it. And, in, and now I realize it's the most profound change in the 20th century in the history of museums. And what am I talking about? Well, first they would talk about things like the objects have power. Or as the Maori would say, they have manna. That they're, these are not dead things. The, the, the break between living and dead is not the same. The emanations of the power of objects, because of their history, because of where they've come from, because of the, what they have witnessed, the object itself has power. And the way you deal with a thing that is not dead is different than a thing that was never alive. And so all our issues of collections care and age and how we, how we access it and who can access it and whether it will be seen or not, all those things are profoundly changed if you start to think of it as another soul. And I once was taken, I, I've written a paper called Singing and Dancing at Night. Um, and I'll tell you the story of that. I was once taken to the Harvard uh, Peabody Museum when I was at the National Museum of the American Indian. 
and they took me to the storeroom. We were all white guys. Um, and they showed me their collections, and they were beautifully arranged in shelves. It was really wonderful. And I said to them, yes, but can they sing, can the objects sing and dance at night? And they looked at me, and I realized they were about to call the guys to take me away, because <laughs> what are we talking about singing and dancing at night? And at that point, I realized that I had understood that my responsibility was to create a place where the objects could sing and dance at night, whether or not I thought they were actually singing and dancing, because the objects in my care were not my objects. They were the objects that belonged to the descendants of the producers. And if they believed they needed to sing and dance at night, then I needed to suspend my training and make it possible for them to do that. And precisely that is what's happened in America, under law and around the world, in, in all the places where indigenous people are happening. So the laws and the rules of ownership, of record keeping, of access, of secretness, of, uh, of collections handling, all have been changed by this acceptance that to own it is not the be all and end all. That the, that the descendants of the makers and their belief system can begin to dictate what our responsibilities are if we're to care for their patrimony. And that's been the most fascinating road for me and I think the most fascinating outcome of all this negotiations in the museum work. I could go on asking you questions all night long, uh, but what I think we're going to do at this stage is open things up to the audience. If any of you uh, have any questions, I'm sure people's curiosity, interest has been piqued by some of Elaine's comments. I first uh, had the uh, benefit of reading your materials when I was getting an MA at U of Chicago, and you had an article in a Daedalus um, um, journal. And um, the professors there were very much uh, in, you know, in respect of uh, your work there. I come to the University of Michigan uh, seven years later, and the professors that I have at the Museum Studies program here are feeding me more uh, Gurian articles, <laughs> and I think that's a reflection on uh, your power in the uh, museum community. Um, I wanted to thank you uh, also, um, and also mention I'm Pokagon Ban Potawatomi Indian. Uh -huh. uh, that's where I come from, that's my bias, or that's my uh, center. Um, and in my class last semester with Ray, and I also want to thank Ray and my cohorts, was we started talking about objects, and objects is lumps of clay or whatever that biographies are written upon. And I spoke up and said, wait a minute, you know, these things write their own autobiographies. Um, they uh, are living things. And to their credit, Ray nor my cohorts called 911. Um, you know, they. So both of us are saved. <laughs> yes, we were, we were saved. Uh, so um, my question, my long winded question, Padawan me Indian, so the question's a long one. My question is with the. Um, financial difficulties that uh, museums like uh, in Milwaukee, um, the uh, uh, public museum in Grand Rapids is having some financial difficulty. Uh, the BIA um, funded museum out in, I think it's Montana. Um, the question becomes museums that are having financial difficulty and have significant American Indian collections. What are your thoughts about their uh, moral or ethical or legal responsibilities to repatriate those collections to these descendants rather than using these collections as assets to uh, somehow, um, you know, fund their operations or... Um, somebody asked me this question two days ago and I hadn't 
heard this story. So I can't really comment on this direct story. Let me back up a second and talk about ownership and repatriation. My experience in repatriation has, has been um, really a good one. And that is that if people of goodwill have real respect for each other, the outcome about how the collection needs to be handled and safe and kept safe is a process of negotiation. I don't know whether Milwaukee plans to sell their collection as a way of getting themselves out of financial difficulty, or anyone plans to do that. Selling one's collection um, is a very complicated issue in America, regardless of who's piece you do, and one that's very muddy at the moment. And that people are being blinded by the monetary value and it is in some cases in conflict with their patrimonial responsibility. Um, for a museum to sell its collection, it has some obligation in the deaccession about who they offer it to first, at least in museum ethics. And um, among that responsibility in the case of um, native collections, one would assume is that they would offer it to the descendants. Often um, descendants in, in their dealing with um, institutions don't want it back necessarily. They don't want it back because of the obligation they assume keeping it safe. And so there's a negotiation about it. I would, I, again, I don't really know what Milwaukee has threatened to do or actually done. But for anybody to deaccession native material at the moment, I. I would be surprised if it went directly to Sotheby's. I mean, I just don't believe that's within the Museum Code of Ethics as the first way of behaving. Um, at some point, some amount of things with negotiations can get sold, do get sold, or get traded, or a number of things happen. But first, it's a matter of negotiation, I think. So. But I need to find out more about the story because you're two two days in a row I've heard this story. Your citizen goes into the library because they want a piece of information. They can get that not from the librarian, but because some other person with that information who has developed it into some format makes that available. You go into the uh, the museum and the artifacts in open storage are there. Uh, the information that the artifact tells by one um, cultural paradigm is the silversmith's information or the bookmaker's information, but not information that is readily as accessible to that visitor as the, the literacy is a different kind of literacy. So how do you help, how, is there a role then for helping that citizen in a museum um, read that new kind of, of language um, and get from that artifact uh, as much or the kind of information they want just as they would from a, from a book. And that, that's one example. So what's the role of the curator? Or uh, take away the title curator, I mean, you know, that keeper of the keys, horse patootie. Um, what is the, what's, what's the role of the interpreter? Um, it's, an es it's an essential question. Um, now, if we transform the job description so that your job is to find um, omnibus information and make it available, as opposed to finding 
private information and parceling it out, um, then given this object, one then wants to have an immense Catholic response to it. What, what can I tell you about this? How it was made, what it, the social context, who owned it, I mean, what stories, and who else can tell things? Um, if we re-describe the job so that you really are the gulper of information and the translator of that, you're a kind of open well of gathering and making it available. That's my hope that people will think that's a fabulous job. Um, now, there are things you could tell me. Like, when you go to Google now, and you put in your phrase, you don't, the first thing you see has been paid for. There's distortions of the system. It is not an open system. On the other hand, they do tell you there's 47 pages. And I, in my perverse way, usually start on page 15. Um, you're not precluded from starting on page 15. And you know, as a citizen, that the way Google works is somebody is paid for hit number one. So there's a kind of transparency, even if it's a cynical transparency. I would like to make that happen. It is, I mean, the other arguments you could have made is that all books are not in the library. There is a screening process, just like there's a screening process in a museum. And we could argue that maybe all books should be there, but I'm not arguing that. But once the book is in there, whatever their screening process, there it is. And once the object is there, I'd just like to, um, Henry Ford is a great place in which we could do this because they have, they have objects to which adhere one story after another, of the open road, of the fantasy road, of the way it was manufactured, of who earned what, and how much did that buy? I mean, I want to I figure out a synaptic way so that um, I have a friend named Ian Witte who, if you're going to come to AAM, they're going to review my book and Ian Witte's book on the same day. And I, He's written an article about this, quite unbeknownst to me, in which he says, I want to go to museums about war and learn about bicycles. I want there to be a way in which the rivulet of your own imagination is allowed to go forward, just like it is on the internet. And I don't quite know how to do that yet. But the question you ask, there's the essential answer is that we need to re-describe the people who collect the information so that they are not the, the spigot, that they believe in a kind of open waterfall of information. I'm Elaine Gazda. I'm a curator at the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology here on campus. And it's primarily a museum of Mediterranean, ancient Mediterranean archaeology, meaning Egypt. I've been to your museum. You have. Oh, good. <laughs> Uh, well, we're building a new wing, and we're rethinking entirely, you know, how to how to present the collections, and um, our heads are reeling with all sorts of questions and possibilities. And um, I think we feel ourselves, because we're all m most of us as curators are also on the teaching faculty, um, a compulsion to explain, a compulsion to interpret. Uh, to be the traditional sort of curator, um, as opposed to the one with the revised job description that you've just mentioned, although it's an intriguing possibility. Um, par partially, I think this is the case because we um, see our evidence as very partial and very fragmentary and in many senses esoteric or, or specialized to an extent that uh, we feel that we need to interpret, we need to create frameworks, we need to create ways of people hooking into what we have um, and what we want them to learn from it. Uh, so I, I guess uh, I, I feel I'm swimming around in this problem and, and wondering what, what kinds of um, perceptions you might have of a museum such as ours and um, advice about where we're going.
or should go. <laughs> well, lucky for you, um, learning theorists believe that a light framework, some clue for somebody, is a good thing. So I'm not even suggesting that you don't explain something. But my experience in museums is that once you're finished explaining what you want to explain, that's the end of it. So you go right ahead. You put your stuff out. You explain what you want to explain. And then set up a system so that I can explain it some other way, organize it some other way, get more information. And then you could start to organize a way to say to us, because computers allow you to do this, here's what we don't know. Here's the evidence we do think about. Here's the, here's the arguments about it. Here's the other thing people think. Here's, here's the partial evidence as accumulated from another location. Here's what that looked like. Because that's easy. I mean, computers accept this vast body of knowledge. So you go tell me what you want to tell me, and then let me find out what I want to find out in addition to that. And I don't think it's an either or. I think um, you get to do that part as long as you like doing more than that. Mostly what's happened in museums is that the curatorial voice has picked its level, picked its information, and then truncated all our access of the before and after that information. And all the doubts are gone. And just give it all to us. In a format that isn't on the wall, put your stuff on the wall. After all, it's your place. It's the other stuff I want. And then allow me to add the other stuff. Um, and then see what happens as other people add, and where else they go, and what your colleagues have to say. The area of visitor studies, has anyone done any research in this area? In fact, is that what most museum goers are interested in? No, it's a really the worst question, because it may be that we're going to build this fascinating place and nobody goes to it. I'm, I, and I don't know that we can devise a study directly, because there is no experience we have about this museum. So I think you're going to have to do experiments, inferential experiments. That is in places where you can browse what is the behavior. Let me give you the other place I'm interested in, and that's the shopping mall. Um, the shopping mall has all this stuff arrayed aesthetically with a frame in which all of us are so experienced as shoppers because shopping is a ubiquitous um, experience that we train our children in that we then reshape the experience, um, regardless of the frame that's been put over it. Um, so if you've come to buy socks, uh, the fact that sweaters are in the front doesn't deter you from your sock quest. And if they show you socks in some place and they're cashmere and they're $70, it doesn't deter you from saying, thank you very much, I'm going to target. Um, and that has something to do with how comfortable we are, or many of us are, in um, asserting ourselves and our quest in a framework that's been organized against us. And it's by experience. I mean, if you also think about where you learn to shop and where you learned about the library, there's real training in all of that. And there's no training or not particular training in museums except you got taken to them once or twice in your childhood. I don't know about you, but for me they were mystical experiences but not welcoming ones. Um, so I, I think we're going to have to 
we're going to have to piece this together. Um, if we look at small historic societies, I think the answer is nobody goes now. So we don't have a lot to lose, is really one of my thoughts. Go 50 years forward and tell us, are, will museums be relevant? And what could a museum 50 years from now be like? Uh, our patrimony is not irrelevant. Our need for civic, civil society is not irrelevant. Our notion of self-worth and group self-worth is not irrelevant. The institution as we now know it of museums, um, I think will be more porous than we currently now know it and may be indistinguishable from a number of other civic institutions that we also need as civic gathering places. Um, the, the, the collection of information that we now can have in technologic ways and, and attach them to things, the, the guided stuff in your car and the, the ubiquitous stuff coming down into iPods, uh, this kind of world of interpretation without walls. I, I think the institution as we now know it will not look the same. I'm, I don't need it to look the same. I mean, the monument to the powerful out of which it was created needs to change anyone. I want you to tell us the, Jew the best Jewish story. That <laughs> <you have. laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> and I can't remember ever any of those. Um, for those of you who've been required to read my stuff, you been required to read Steve Weil's stuff as well. Um, Steve Weil, as you all know, has just died or died a year ago. And his memorial service um, was filled with jokes because Steve Weil, you could call Steve Weil up any day of the you wish and say, can I have a joke? And he would tell you a joke. Um, so the joke that started his, uh, his memorial service was Jim Demetrian, for whom he had been the, Steve Wall had been the deputy director of the Hirshhorn. Jim Demetrian had been the director of the Hirshhorn. Got up and he said, it was, was a moment of we were all very sad. He, he got up and he said, the humble director the arrogant director and the Easter Bunny are in a bar together. So you can imagine we all fell over <laughs> laughing. <laughs> and they spy a quarter on the floor. Who picks it up? The answer, the arrogant director, because the other two are figments of your imagination. <laughs> 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 Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.